today at this first talk I feel that we should talk about one specific topic and that topic is our problem everyone's problem the reason that I want to talk about this topic is because if we don't understand what our problem is and what our problems are then we don't know why we're here and we don't know what we're doing when we come to study the Dhamma when we come to practice Vipassana without an understanding of what our problems are we won't know what we're doing and we'll be wasting our time so therefore I'd like to begin by talking about our problems everyone's problems we like to use a short phrase when we talk about our problem this phrase is the burden of life the burden of life if we feel if one of each of us as an individual feels or any one of us feels that our life is completely free of problems that we have no burdens and that everything is fine anyone who feels this way will not benefit at all from studying Dhamma and practicing insight meditation therefore anyone who feels this way doesn't need to waste their time here at Suan Mok. However, if we do feel that there are problems, problems of the sort that we would call the burdens of life, if we feel that we do have these sort of problems, then we can benefit very much from studying the Dhamma and practicing vipassana meditation and so we need to consider this point from the very beginning there's something complicated and a bit amusing about the phrase the burden of life when we use this phrase it is something that can be correctly understood and the meaning is basically correct however it's not completely correct it's a bit off the mark the reason that the burden of life might not completely convey the the truth is because life itself is the burden life itself is this burden when we say the burden of life it sounds as if we're separating the two the burden and life from each other making them two different things but in reality life itself is this burden our problem is life and so this is the point that we have to consider we have to study life if we're going to get anywhere so life has this symptom of heaviness or of burdensome of being burdensome this symptom of life is something that needs to be studied and understood we can say that life is the burden of life there's this symptom of of weight and of burdensomeness which is interfering in disturbing life so this this symptom of life is the burden of life now if we see that see this symptom as it arises and interferes then we will have some understanding of the problem we need to be able to look until we clearly see that there is this burden of that life is this burden of life 
which disturbs life, it batters life, it attacks life, and in the end, it torments life. If we see this symptom, which is attacking, battering, and tormenting life, then we'll understand what the problem is. And only then do we begin to understand what the Dhamma is about. If we're someone who thinks that everything's already wonderful and perfect and that everything's fine, then all this Dhamma is of absolutely no use whatsoever. The purpose of the Dhamma is only one thing. The purpose of the Dhamma is to solve our problems to help us deal with and be free from the condition of unsatisfactoriness, which we call tukkha. Dhamma is only to help us to be free of tukkha, to understand and free ourselves from this condition of painfulness and satisfactoriness and all the other unpleasantries and disturbing aspects of life. This is what the Dhamma is about. And so we need to have insights into this problem, into the burden of life, the tukkha of life. And then we'll know why we're here to learn about the Dhamma and why we're here to practice the Dhamma. Imagine there's a person who feels completely healthy completely free of all illness, sickness, and physical disability. Wouldn't it be ridiculous for this people to go to a drugstore or clinic or some place that passes out medicine? What would be the point in this person who considers himself or herself completely healthy to go get some medicine? Why, why would this person feel inclined to go and get some medicine. What's the meaning in that? What's the rationale and intelligence in getting medicine when one feels completely healthy? It can be the same with the Dhamma. People who, who don't see any problems, who don't, aren't aware of any tukkha, any unsatisfactoriness in their lives, but yet they come and make, a, make some sort of attempt to study the Dhamma and to practice meditation. What's the point of that? If people don't have any awareness of a problem or of tukkha, then their activity in going through a meditation retreat or something like that can be nothing but just doing what is popular or what is a current fashion or just because their friends do it or because it sounds mysterious or it's another stop on the tour of Thailand or whatever. We can get wrapped up in, into meditation and turn it into a meaningless tradition or a silly rite and ritual if we don't practice it for the right reasons. And therefore, if we're here to study the Dhamma and practice meditation, we need to understand the reason for doing so. Otherwise, we are like a person who is completely healthy but goes off in search of medicine for no, no intelligent reason. Now, if you're new to this, this thing we call Dhamma, and if you're new to meditation, we're not expecting you to immediately agree that you've got all sorts of problems and are suffering from all kinds of tukkha and burdens of life. We're not expecting you to, to agree with all this. However, if you're coming here, you can look at it as similar to going to the doctor 
or the hospital for a physical checkup. We may not be, if we're not completely sure that our health is perfect, we'll go to the doctor and he'll look us over and see if there's anything wrong. We can look at this meditation course or the study of Dhamma in the same way. If we're not sure yet whether or not we have any tukka and any problems, then we can look at this as a checkup. It's a chance to examine yourself, get to know yourself, find out what you really are, find out what shape you're in, and find out what should be done once you know what shape you're in. If we look at this as a checkup, as self-examination to see how we're doing, whether there are any problems or not, this approach is not lacking in intelligence. It has some reason and sense in it. So if you're not sure yet whether or not there are any problems, then approach the Dhamma as a means to check things out and examine yourself. An absolutely essential condition for the proper study of Dhamma is the, the desire, the need to be free of tukka, or we can say to be, to be free of disease and illness. Without this desire and intention to be free of all unsatisfactory mind states, and all unsatisfying, dissatisfying conditions. Without this need, without this intention, then it's like we're just daydreaming. We really don't know what we're doing and we're just muddling about. So this is an absolutely essential condition to correct practice and study of Dhamma. Without this, we may have ju we just may be following a current fashion or a crowd of people who wandered over from some beach or we're just following what other people are doing we're turning it into a little tradition amongst amongst ourselves who knows what we're doing if we don't have this desire to end tukka this is absolutely essential but it's, it's quite amusing and quite sad that nobody has this desire. We wander through life in a little cloud as if nothing were wrong. And when something goes wrong, we pretend it's not there. But we never really develop a keen and powerful urge to get free of all that tukka, of all the problems and burdens that torment life. We never have this desire and without it we cannot practice Dhamma. So be aware of this desire. Do you want to be healthy or not? This isn't an intellectual decision. Oh sure, I want to be healthy, which most people will admit to quite readily. But it's a deep-seated urge that begins to work and take over one's life, where one's life is oriented to being healthy, spiritually healthy, which means free of tukka. This desire, this need to be free of dukkha can be compared to if someone took you and threw you in the ocean or a river and held your head under the water for, for two, three, four, five minutes. Imagine that if somebody was holding you under the water and you, were, you had no oxygen to breathe. What kind of desire and need would be in you to get your head above the water so you could breathe? Can you imagine this? How would you feel if somebody was 
keeping your head under the water so you couldn't breathe. That kind of desire that one would have when being drowned is the kind of desire that we need to be free of tukka, to be free of the problems of life, of all the mental states, of all the defilements, all the unnecessary things which cloud and disturb the mind and destroy the mind's natural brightness and clarity. To, to get beyond all this tukka, we need this desire, and this dire mu- desire must be of the strength of someone who has had their head held under the water. Or in the Pali scriptures, the Buddha compared it to someone whose head is on fire. One's hair and whatever is burning, and there are flames shooting up and burning, burning one's head. If you had a fire on your head, if your head was on fire, would you sort of sit around twiddling your thumbs without making any effort to put it out? Or would there be a strong desire to do something to put out this fire? These two examples illustrate the strength that is necessary within this desire and need to extinguish tukka. This is what is necessary for successful practice. And you can use it as a measure on yourself. Do you have a desire to extinguish dukkha that is as strong as someone whose head is on fire would have for putting out that fire? Is your desire this strong or not? For the majority of people, they have no awareness of tukka within the mind. There may be some intellectual opinions about this matter from reading books or talking with someone, but there is no clear realization within the mind that there is tukka. But in spite of this, we come here to to extinguish tukka, to get rid of this tukka which is quite funny. We're not even aware of tukkha, and we want to get rid of it. What's the sense in, in that? This condition, though, should be looked into a little bit more closely. For you, when you come to Suanmok, it's quite natural that there will not be any tukkha, because you come here as a visitor. You don't stay here very long, you have no responsibilities, and nothing here belongs to you. There's nothing here that is yours, and so there is nothing that you must be responsible for, that you must worry about, and that you must take care of. And so it's very easy for you to come to a place like Suan Mok and be quite comfortable and free of of tukka. This can be quite automatic. And so you come here, and there's no tukka, but you're here to extinguish tukka. So what's going on? Here there's no tukka, but think about it. What will happen when you go home? Go back to some place where you do have responsibilities, possessions, belongings, things you have to do. Will you? Will there be things that you worry about? Will there be problems then? Will there be tukka? There might not be tukka here, but there may be when you go back home or to wherever you have responsibilities and belongings. So this points out the necessity that we must understand what tukka is and how it affects life. What is the influence and bearing of tukka upon life. This we need to be very clear about. 
not some intellectual, theoretical, abstract opinion on the matter, but some direct understanding of one's own life and the tukkha, the problems, the unsatisfactoriness, the pain within one's own life. This is what we must be aware of and understand and then begin to have some ways, some techniques of dealing with that tukkha that does arise in our life. So this needs to be done. So in order to understand this dukkha, these problems that exist within our own lives, we need to discuss the problems of life. And so we're going to take some time to talk about this thing we call tukkha. We'll discuss it in order to develop some awareness and understanding of how of the part it plays <coughs> in our lives. Tukkha is something that is involved with many, many different facts and there are many secrets associated with it that we can discuss. For example, if it wasn't for this thing Tukkha, if there was no such thing as Tukkha, then there would be no, no religion in the world. Without Tukkha, there would not be any prophets, any saints, any founders of religion, any sages, any wise men. It's only because of Tukkha that all these things have arisen in the world. It's through Tukkha that certain minds have set out to understand this thing and find a way out of it. And so because of Tukkha, there arise the Jesus Christs, the Buddhas, the Mohammeds, the Lao Tzu's of the world. These minds who have understood Tukkha and found and worked for ways to be free of it and then have taught the way to be free of Tukkha to others. And in this way, Tukkha has been the cause for the various prophets and religions which we have. This is one of the secrets of Tukkha. The cleverness of humanity and our intelligence is another thing that exists because of Tukkha. All the things which humanity has accomplished, all the inventions, all the ideas, all the things that we have done, all the material developments, exist only because of Tukkha. It's in our desire and through our desire and need to be free of Tukkha that mankind has been spurred on to create all the clothing, housing, medicine, and all the other things we have in this world. The, the high level of material development of what we call modern civilization is completely conditioned and caused by Tukka. Only because of this thing would we put all this time and effort into all these things we do. But we very seldom take the time to look at this matter deeply. We never really examine it closely to realize the place, this important position Tukka has in human life. We don't look and so we don't see. And so some of us may even think that Tukka doesn't even exist. And so this is another way we can begin to look at Tukka to see what it is and what, what role it plays in our lives. Or in your own case, have you come to Suan Mok because Tukka has driven you here? Has the whip of Tukka been, been driving you and whipping you and spurring you here like a herd of, of frightened cattle? Is this why you're here, because Tukka has driven you here? Or have you just come out of curiosity? 
just because you're traveling around Thailand and this is another place in the guidebook or somebody at some bungalow or guest house told you it was a nice place to stay for a few days. Why are you here? Do you see the tuka that is driving you here? Or are you just here to, to have a look around, enjoy yourself, and have a few pleasant days in the forest? Take a look at yourself and see what place, what role, what influence tuka has within your own life. This point is very important. Until you begin to see what tuka is doing and how central it is in what you do, what you say, what you think, then you'll never have the desire, the strong and powerful need to get rid of this dukkha, to understand what dukkha is, to know it, and then take it apart so that you know the escape from it. Until you see this tuka, you'll never have the desire to be free of it. And so this point is very, very important. It's very serious and essential. And so we'll keep repeating ourselves on it and keep harping upon this point in order that you may begin to understand what we're talking about. If we look at this matter in the most favorable light, we can see that Tuka is both a friend and an enemy. We need to, this is very useful to look at Tuka on this deeper level where we see that it is both friend and enemy. For those of you who are beginning to understand what Tuka is, you may wonder what we're talking about when we say that Tuka is a friend. But if you've really examined Tuka, you'll see that in some respects it is a friend because as we mentioned already, it's Tuka that makes us clever and intelligent. It's only through Tuka that we ever learn anything. We don't learn anything from being happy. We learn from mistakes, from problems, from Tuka. Tuka is what makes us intelligent. It's what causes us to grow in wisdom. Tuka is what has spurred on all of human evolu evolution. And so, whatever degree human consciousness has developed to, it is only done so because of the friendship of Tuka. Tuka is responsible for all this intelligence and wisdom. But on the other hand, Tuka bites us, it slaps us, it's painful, it torments us. And so in this way, Tuka is also an enemy. It's Tuka that is slapping us around, whipping us, biting us, and driving us. We're always trying to get free of Tuka, whether we realize it or not. We're always trying to flee it, run away, escape from this enemy of ours. If we can see both of these aspects of Tuka, we'll, be, we'll begin to understand Tuka on a profound level. We'll be seeing Tuka on the level of Satipanya, mindful wisdom. This is knowledge that is based in awareness, self-awareness, and an understanding of life. It's the opposite of stupidity. If our understanding of Tukka is foolish, childish, and stupid, it'll be of no use to us. But when our understanding of Tukka is deep, profound, and based in mindful wisdom, then it will be of tremendous use. Now what we're, we're interested in doing is developing this mindful, wise approach to Tukka. If we do so, 
then we can emphasize Tukka in its aspect as friend. Or we can use the word comrade. We can emphasize Tukka as our comrade and de-emphasize the aspect of it being an enemy. What we mean by this is make use of what Tukka offers us. Use Tukka to develop the mind, to train the mind, to grow in wisdom and understanding. In this way, Tukka is a friend, it's a comrade. But learn also, in, and in doing so, in, in using Tukka as a friend, then there is less and less opportunity for Tukka to be an enemy. Tukka will not bite and claw and scratch and torment us so much. And so we can emphasize the aspect as a friend and diminish the torment and painful, the enemy aspect of Tukka. This is a mindful and wise way to approach Tukka by taking it as a friend. Don't, don't let it go by itself. Don't leave it on its own where it will remain an enemy. Now we can look at Tukka a little bit deeper. We can see that Tukka, the condition of Tukka, is common to all of us. Each of us has this one thing in common. We have Tukka in common. It is something that we all experience. And in, on this level, we are all the same. We are in no way different. We are also the same in that the absence of Tukka is, is identical for all of us. When there is no Tukka, then it's the same for each of us. So in this condition, when there is no Tukka, this is also identical for each of us. So in, in these two ways, or maybe in this one way, we are all the same. We are the same when there is Tukka, it's the same experience for us all, and the absence of Tukka, the freedom from Tukka, is identical for everyone. We have these things in common. If we look at the characteristics of Tukka and see what kind of things we can observe about it, what are the symptoms, what are the marks and signs of Tukka? We can look at it in a variety of ways. One way is to see that Tukka is the absence of, or is the lack of relaxation for the spirit. Ajahn Buddhadasa phrased it, there is no resting place for the suffering soul. The suffering soul has no place to rest and relax its weary bones. This is an aspect of Tukka, the, the lack of spiritual relaxation. What we mean by this is that there is the constant process of conditioning. Various causes and conditioning and conditions are spinning round and round, compounding each other. And this constant conditioning doesn't give the spirit or soul or whatever any chance to rest and relax. All this conditioning catches up the spirit and when it's caught in all this, this mess of causes and effects and interrelationships and everything, then the spirit cannot rest. The suffering soul has no resting place. This is an essential characteristic of Tukka. So the first aspect we have on Tukka is the the absence of spiritual rest, which is caused by all the conditioning. And this conditioning is, is in turn caused by ignorance or not knowing, not understanding the way things are, or by craving, 
This ignorance and craving keeps all this conditioning spinning and this never gives the spirit a chance to rest and relax. Another angle on Tuka is the fact that there is nothing in this world that goes the way we want it to go. We can't, we can't have things the way we want them. Things just don't happen according to our, our wishes and desires. Maybe every now and then something accidentally turns out in a way that pleases us. But if we look at human society, for instance, all of us are aware of countless things that aren't fitting in with our wishes. The world, all the wars, the starvation, all the problems, all the political messes, the economic exploitation, all this stuff, one way or another, isn't according with our wishes. So this is tuka. Things don't go the way we want them to go. Or to look more close, come closer to home, even our own bodies. Do our bodies really do what we want them to do? They're getting old, getting sick, falling apart, slowly but steadily. The, our bodies don't go the way we want them to go. They aren't the way we want them to be. This is tukka. So this is the second aspect of tukka which we want to point out to you, that all these things are never the way we want them to be. Which brings up the problem for us of how do we live in a, with these, all these things that don't go the way we want them to go? What are we going to do about all these things? What can we do? How can we adjust ourselves? How can we cope with all this? How do, what do we need to do with the mind so that we can live in a way that is appropriate to a world where everything goes its own way, where nothing satisfies our wishes. What do we need to do? This is the second aspect of tukka. A third angle on tukka is the, the fact of our lives that we can't stop wanting things. We just can't avoid wanting and wishing and hoping and desiring. We, we can't avoid this. There's always something stirring up all our wishes and desires, our craving and wanting. We call this, this thing that stirs up all the desires, all the craving, we call it avicca. Vicha means knowing. Avicca is not knowing. Or we can say ignorance, the lack of correct understanding, the lack of correct knowledge is always giving rise to this craving. We can say that it's also giving rise to the gilesa, the defilements, these states which, these phenomena in states of mind that arise and disturb the mind, disrupt the mind, interfere with the natural peace and brightness of the mind. So this ignorance and defilement is always conditioning, craving, ignorant desire. And as and all of this, this goes round and round and we're unable to stop it. When, and by being caught up in this perpetual craving, this is another aspect of tukka. Now this third aspect of tukka has a very important point which we should consider. This is that there is a certain master which has control over us. This is a very fierce master. This tyrant is, is dominating our lives and turns us into slaves. 
And the name of this tyrant is defilement. It's the defilements which are our masters. And this, the funny thing about this is that we volunteer. We're, we're completely willing to be slaves to this evil and fierce tyrant, the defilements, the gilesas, the mental impurities. We volunteer to be slaves to this, this tyrant, these tyrants, and so we spend our lives running here and there, doing this, doing that, under the orders and commands of the defilements. This is the state we're in. And we don't even notice it. We're so busy running around carrying out the orders and commands of this, these tyrants that we never even realize what state we're in. We don't even understand the situation and see how much tukka it is. This, this aspect of tukka is, is really horrible and it is something that needs to be understood. This kind of slavery, the slavery to the defilements, is the worst kind of slavery that there is. If you, we compare this slavery to the defilements with all the other kinds of slavery that have existed in the world, all the other kinds pale before it. The kind of slavery that has existed, say, in the United States over a hundred years ago, or in India, or even in Thailand, where one human being is a slave to another. This kind of slavery is nothing compared to the slavery, to the defilements, which we all so willingly enter into. But this kind of slavery is a very fierce kind of tukka. Another aspect of Tukka to look at, which is a bit more limited or more, more concentrated than the previous, is, can be described in a way that Buddhists like to talk. It's not discussed so much in other traditions. We Buddhists like to say that this fourth aspect of Dukkha is being slaves to the ayatana. The ayatana are the sense spheres, we can say, which includes the internal sense spheres or the sense organs, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. There are six sense organs. And then the corresponding external sense objects, sights, shapes, go with the eyes, and then sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and mental phenomena. So these are the ayantana, the sense spheres, inner and external, and we are slaves to them. We very willingly serve these sense spheres, the sense organs and sense objects throughout our lives. We do whatever they tell us to do. We're always following them blindly, being conditioned by them. If you understand this, then you'll truly understand how reprehensible and foul Tukka is. If you understand this situation of being slaves to the sense spheres. Actually, the sense spheres are just the fuel, the bait of the defilements. They're what catches us into defilement. And so, this fourth aspect really isn't any different than the third aspect. It's just a little more specific in the way we phrase it. And so, being a slave to the ayantana is a fourth aspect of dukkha, by which, as we begin to see this, we begin to understand how, how wrong and unnecessary dukkha is. Something to consider about this fourth aspect is that all the work we have done in our lives, all the things we have done in order to earn money or, or whatever way they repay us for our sweat and labor, 
all this work we have done is just to get money in order to respond to our defilements. All the work we do, all we're trying to do is get the means by which we can try and satisfy our defilements, do what our defilements want us to do, tell us to do. And so we are very loyal slaves to the defilements. If you kept a record throughout your life of how you spent your money, you would see that this is true. The way we do this is we, we get some money and then we, we go out and we try to satisfy some defilement through one of the sense spheres. We, we try and satisfy these defiled states of mind, these defilements, by, through the eyes, some, with some visual experience or oral experience or some, whatever you say for the nose, gustatory, some, some tastes, trying to get some pleasing, satisfying, delicious, luxurious experience through one of the senses. In this way, all the work, all our labor, all our sweat is being spent on the defilements. And the defilements are trying to, to work themselves out through the, the senses. This is an absolutely essential point. It's the same essential point we've been pointing at throughout this talk. If you don't see this, this point of how we've been spending all our, our labor and efforts in trying to respond to the defilements through the, through the senses, one, one sense or another, one way or another. If you don't see this, then it's basically hopeless for you to study the Dhamma. If you don't begin to understand this point, then there's no way you're going to be able to understand the Dhamma, be able to practice the Dhamma, or make, or do anything useful with meditation. Actually, if you don't understand this point, you'll never meditate. You'll be just imitating a meditator, but there won't be any genuine meditation. So take a look at this point really carefully. Look at it, observe it, stare at it, gaze at it, scrutinize it, until you see it and realize the truth of this point. Now, if we take everything that's been discussed so far and we want to summarize it, that can be done quite easily. When we talk about being a slave to the defilements, or talk about being a slave to the sense spheres, we can summarize both of these by saying that the essential core problem the heart of the problem is our slavery to the Vedana. Vedana is a very, very important Pali word. Pali is the language of the Buddhist scriptures that we use. We have this word Vedana. I'll try and explain it to you for those of you who are, are new. It's often translated feelings, but be careful because the word feelings includes many things that are not the same as the Vedana. Vedana is somewhat, is a specific aspect of what we call in English the feelings. What the Vedana is, are, is that when there is, say, seeing, when the eyes make contact with some sight, and then there is, there is a mental there's both the physical seeing and a mental component. And when all this happens, there is the experience of seeing, the visual experience which we call seeing. When there is this experience, the mind reacts to it, or the mind heart, we can say, reacts to it. Either it, it moves towards that experience, or it backs away, or it vacillates 
in uncertainty. And these three kinds of reactions to experience, whether visual or by oral or through one of the other senses, this reaction to experience, this immediate habitual reaction is called vetana or feelings. It's either pleasant when the mind goes towards the experience or unpleasant when it tries to move away or it's uncertain when it doesn't know whether to be pleased or displeased. These are the vetana and they are central to all of our problems. So we can summarize all these problems of tukka by saying that tukka arises because of slavery to the vetana. The Buddha said that all that, that the vetana are the root of all dhammas, of all things. All things can be traced to the vetana. For example, ignorance or wrong understanding, wrong view, some of the prejudices and biases we have, the, all the prejudices and biases we have can be traced to the vetana, these feelings of liking, disliking, and uncertainty. Craving, attachment, all these can be traced to the vetana, and therefore tukka can always be traced to the vetana. This shows how central the vetana are, and as long as we are a slave, as long as we or our minds, as long as the human mind is a slave to the vetana, then there will be tukka arising because of that slavery. So we need to understand this point, begin to see it. Because if it's possible to take care of the vetana properly, then there will be no tukka arising from them. We are spurred into all kinds of activities and kinds of craving because of the vetana. For example, all our sexual impulses arise because of the vetana. And also, all of the egoism and pride and selfishness by which we, we mess up our own lives and the lives of others, all this can be traced to the vetana. The vetana are the meeting point, the gathering point, the thing that links together all our problems. And so this is why we say that slavery to the vetana is the heart of all our problems. It's the summary of everything we've been saying today. When there is slavery to the defilements, then there is, in that is slavery to the vetana. When there is slavery to the sense organs, the sense spheres, in that there is also slavery to the feelings. All, we can go so far as to say that the whole world, all of the world, is enslaved, is enthralled with the Vedana. All sentient beings are under the power and control of the Vedana. And so our, our hope, the way to be free of dukkha, is to, to get the mind above the Vedana, get the mind out from under this control and power of these feelings. In this way, we summarize everything that has been discussed so far. So we'd like to request, we implore you, in fact, to remember this word vetana, vetana, or in Thai, vetana. It's spelled in Roman letters V-E-D-A-N-A, -A, vetana or vetana. Please remember this word. Use the Pali word even if it's unfamiliar to you because the meaning is much more important than the meaning of the word feelings. If you, get, if you insist on clinging to the English words, you will often be left with only half of the meaning 
that is intended. So please, please remember this word, Vedana. Get interested in it, begin to understand it, what is meant here. Because in the Vedana, all, all human activity is caused by the Vedana. You can see everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, all, all movements that you make, whether they are physical movements of the body or mental movements of the mind or the heart, emotional movements, whatever. Whatever kind of movements, physical or mental, these movements are caused by the Vedana. When you can see that everything you do and have been doing throughout your life, with no exception whatsoever, has been caused by the Vedana. The pleasant feelings, the pleasant, likable Vedana. You've been running after these things, chasing after them your whole life. You've been doing all sorts of things to get a hold of these pleasant Vedana. And on the other hand, there are all the unpleasant, the dislikable Vedana, which you have been fleeing. You've been doing whatever you can to escape from these unpleasant Vedana, such as those of you who are rubbing your face or can't sit still because of various, various discomfort that's always causing you to scratch your head or shift your position or rock back and forth or who knows what. You're spending all your time either running away from the unpleasant Vedana or chasing after the pleasant ones. This is what we mean by saying that the, the mind of sentient beings are enslaved to the Vedana. This, this shows the central importance of these things. The Buddha said that all dhammas, all things, Everything that you need to know is associated with the Vedana. This is the gathering point of everything that needs to be understood. If you understand the old saying that all roads lead to Rome, back in the Roman Empire, all roads lead to Rome. If you understand what we mean, what that means, then you'll understand what we mean when we say all things are associated with the Vedana. Everything has to do with the Vedana. And so this is an absolutely central and crucial thing to understand. So please don't be scared off by this foreign word. Remember the word and then begin to appreciate and understand what it means. We really want to <coughs> emphasize how central the Vedana are to everything, everything that has to do with human life, human experience, is associated with, is tied to the Vedana. Try to, there's a, a very good word in Pali, and we're struggling to find the adequate words to express it in, in English. That, that task is left to me, and I'm doing my best to think of the proper words. We want to stress that everything in life, all human experience and activity, whether physical or mental, via the body, the mouth, or the mind, all this is tied to the Vedana. All these things are gathered together in the Vedana. We can say the Vedana are the, the meeting place of everything. Everything you're doing, even the, the small, minute, minor things that are going on as you sit and listen at this very moment, all these are caught up in the Vedana, are conditioned by the Vedana. For example, as you're listening, if you like what's being said, that's Vedana. If you dislike what's being said, that's Vedana. If, as you listen, you think what's being said has value for you, 
and so you're more even you like it even more well that's even more vetana or if you don't like what's being said and it starts to annoy you well that's even more vetana too and so if if you really like what's being said it satisfies you you think it's useful that'll cause you to listen more carefully more attentively but if you don't like what's being said that kind of vetana will cause you to start daydreaming your mind will wander maybe you'll fall asleep maybe you'll even get up and leave or the little movements of your body and and whatever your mind's doing now whether it's paying attention or 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 sleeping or who knows what all of this is conditioned by the vetana these the vetana are the absolute center the meeting point of everything in human life we want to stress this so that you see how central this is and then maybe you'll begin to take some interest in it all the things that we call the burden of life are centered in the vetana all the problems of life all the tukha are centered in the vetana all the things that happen things were satisfying things unsatisfying things pleasing things unpleasing things happiness unhappiness all this is centered in the vetana we're either slaves to the vetana or the mind is developed so that it is above the vetana think about it look at it and then develop the mind and practice the dhamma to you actually experience what's being said here it's crucial and essential all of you have come here from far away from america canada maybe germany australia japan from all over the world and all of you without one exception has come here because of the vetana some vetana has caused you to come here now some of you are saying to yourself oh they don't know what they're talking about i came here because i wanted to i'm traveling because i want to nothing sent me here nothing made me come but if you examine things carefully and honestly you'll see that your very wants and desires have been conditioned by the vetana you're wanting to leave say germany because you don't like it there or something or because the weather's cold and you want to come somewhere where it's warm or you want some exotic experiences or you like eating rice or you're running away from this or you want to get that whatever your reasons for traveling and whatever your reasons and motivations for coming to suan mok behind all of these reasons desires wants and motivations are the vetana trying to get certain pleasant feelings and avoid unpleasant feelings everything these are what run your lives as human beings we tend to be very proud of our independence our freedom we think because we can we've got the money to go here and go there and eat this and buy that we think we're free and independent we think we have will power free will we make choices this is what we think and it makes us proud and stupid cuz really we're just slaves to the vetana we don't make any choices we just do what the vetana tell us to do this is what we mean by the burden of life can you appreciate what a burden this is this perpetual slavery the kind of slavery where where some white man purchases a black man and uses him to uses him to pick cotton as was done in the united states over 100 years ago that kind of slave still had some some time to do what he wanted sing a song eat some food but the slavery we're talking about here there's no respite 
you're a slave all the time. Can you appreciate what a heavy, awesome, debilitating burden this is? Can you appreciate what we mean by the burden of life that we've been talking about today? If you understand this complete dominance the Vedana have upon the mind, then you will begin to under, then you will understand what the burden of life is. Now if we look deep, 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 deep into this matter, to the very core of it, on a very on the most profound level, then we'll appreciate what we mean by the burden of life. By seeing how every movement, even the smallest, tiniest movement of your bodies or minds, are caused by the Vedana. Because of some liking or disliking, then there is some kind of craving to get something or be something or not be something or get rid of something. These, these feelings lead to craving. And because of this craving, there is always tukka. When, there is cr- when craving arises, Tukka is, is, cert, is a certainty. And so all Tukka is, caught, is caused by Vedana. All the unpleasantness, all the difficulties, all the problems, all the things that make you sad, unhappy, frustrated, that make you worried, afraid, that make you stupid, that make you do silly, forgetful things, all this is centered in the Vedana. So this is why we harp on this point and keep coming back to it and emphasizing it. This slavery to the Vedana is something that you may not you may not like to hear it, but you better face up to the fact. Because right now all of you are are blindly and happily selling your souls to the Vedana. You serve these Vedana without batting an eye. With no second thoughts, you just do whatever the Vedana tell you. You're a menial, obedient, loyal slave to the Vedana. But these Vedana causes so much tukka when we carry out the commands of the Vedana. It just brings us difficulties. It gets us into all kinds of hassles, uncomfortable situations, problems, and pains. All of this, everything that's not quite right with life, everything that's unsatisfying in life, is caught up in the Vedana, are caused by the Vedana. So don't be afraid to look at this. Take some time. Quit running around and sit and study this matter so you can understand it. So if you want to be free, really free, you have to understand the Vedana, this problem of our slavery to the Vedana, this burden of life. Please take the time to study this. Be patient and do the work that needs to be done so that you will understand not just intellectually, but realize within the depths of the heart and mind what this is we're talking about. Please take the time. There's one last point we need to analyze and criticize. This is the subject of education and learning, not in general, but our own, our own education and learning. All of us here have some kind of diploma from secondary school or from university. A few of you probably have master's degrees. There might be even a few doctors around. But if you look at all this learning, the the 8, 10, 12, 16, 20, 30 years we spend in educational institutions, 
What are they teaching? Do any of these institutions, do the famous universities in America, England, Australia, France, Germany, wherever, do these places teach about the Vedana? Do they teach us to look at and understand this slavery to the Vedana and then how to be free of it? Is this being taught anywhere? In all your years of education, has anybody taught you about this? Have you ever had a course in it? I doubt it, because if you did, you wouldn't have to come here. You would have already solved the problems of life. None of the universities, none of those pieces of paper they pass out, none of that has anything to do with solving this problem of slavery to the Vedana. It's completely ignored. In fact, what they really teach, we can take everything that's taught in the schools, colleges, universities, and educational institutions of the, both the East and West, we can take all that and summarize it that what they're teaching us, what we have been taught in all our years in school, is to be servants to the Vedana. All the little intellectual and physical tricks that we learn. We learn mathematics, we learn geography, psychology, sociology, chemistry. All this stuff they teach us is just for us to follow the Vedana, to go get a job and earn money so we can buy things that satisfy the Vedana, or we, we puff up our egos with our, our knowledge and degrees, or we, we gain status, or people like us, or we're impressive, or whatever. All the things we accomplish, all the, all the things they teach are just to be servants, slaves to the Vedana. All this modern education, all this which we're very proud of, is just helping us or keeping us spinning around as slaves to craving and defilement. It's all it is. It has nothing to do with freedom of liberating the mind from this slavery. And so that's why when we come here, we have to start talking about this, because it's not taught in all the places we've been educated. So when you come to Suan Mok, or places like Suan Mok, we have to talk about this topic, slavery to the Vedana. Talk about it so that we'll begin to do something about it, and get, get freed from the Vedana. So we've been talking about our problems, and we summarized it as the problem of slavery to the Vedana. We haven't finished discussing this topic of our problems, but we're going to have to stop speaking for today and finish this tomorrow. We have to stop speaking because the Vedana won't let us speak anymore. The Vedana have control. Because of the Vedana, we have to stop speaking now. And so we will close the talk at this point. See you tomorrow.